Good morning and welcome to Real Estate Economics webinar series. I'm John Movo and I'll be leading us through a look at the Portland Vancouver Beaverton MSA. At this point in time, most of the time when we uh, conduct these webinars and take a look at these individual market areas, people tend to be focused on employment, trends in employment, direction in employment change, what industry groups are uh, growing or contracting, and that's uh, the focus of our presentation today. As you can see in this particular area, Portland had a very severe downdraft uh, beginning in 2008 when the numerical job losses began to emerge, but that really went back to 2007. In 2007, the employment picture had a complete character change and went from significant sustained growth that it experienced over four or five years uh, previous and began to trend lower. 2008 was practically a flat year with very few job gains or losses on an annual basis, but uh, there was a tremendous slowdown that led to the drown downdraft you can see in this particular slide. Uh, 2010 was very much a mixed year with a slow beginning of the year and then a rapid improvement in the second half of the year, and that carried over into 2011 and 2012. We tend to like to look at these markets on a year-over-year -year basis because almost all markets nationally have significant seasonality built into not only the home sales patterns but patterns in employment. Uh, different types of workers are active and inactive uh, at different parts of the year so that year-over-year -year comparison becomes uh, quite significant. In this particular area, March 2011 to March 2012, there was an approximate gain of 11,100 jobs. If you look at that full year in terms of sectors, you can see what's transpired here. Uh, leisure and hospitality has been good. Trade, transportation, and utilities is an area of increasing focus here. And construction really picked up legs in the last year. Again, this covers the 2011 to 2012 time frame. Uh, continuing to weaken and really maybe on its initial downdraft is government. Uh, professional and business services uh, fluctuates a bit. We're a little surprised to see a downdraft there and then information has been a little volatile in other areas. There's a number of uh, different subgroups and in information that tend to move around quite a bit so we don't think that's reflecting any uh, weakness in the tech sector. Let's go back a full year and see what the conditions were like in March 2010 to March 2011. This is really when this market took off. Look at the uh, large growth in business and professional services. Educational and health services were good here. Leisure and hospitality. Uh, construction was just catching its legs here and trade, transportation, and utilities was in a growth phase. Now during 2010 and 2011, um, the the federal government was providing quite a bit of assistance to the states and to the municipalities through the American Recovery and Investment Act, if you recall, that provided uh, money to local school districts, uh, fire and police forces, and also funded a number of construction projects which translated into quite a few jobs in this market. You can see how this looks year over year going back to 1991. This is again a little bit of an interesting area because it's not all that commonly associated with high tech, but you can see the downdraft that took place in this particular area in 2001, 2002, and 2003. Almost all markets we see there have a, a tech sector that responded to the dot-com bubble uh, bursting. The next few years was typically uh, positive in most of the western markets in the U.S. as subprime led to a lot of construction jobs. And as I mentioned earlier, you can see 2008. It's essentially flat, down only 692 jobs on an annual basis, but it's that change from uh, several years of sustained relatively high growth rates to a flat growth environment that really starts to take its toll on the real estate market here. 2009, again, very negative, losing 60,000 jobs, and 2010, losing almost 5,000. But as we mentioned a moment ago, nearly all those losses took place in the first half of the year, and this market uh, corrected pretty robustly in the back half of the year. 2011 was good, and we've got positive growth through the rest of the years of the forecast here. 
Let's look at this on an annual basis going back to 1990. Again, you can see the little surge in employment that took place in advance of the dot-com uh, period in 2000 and 2001. Uh, big boom in construction in 05, uh, really 04, 05, 06. And then notice the flat period, 06 and 07. Uh, really end into 08 where the job totals remain almost unchanged from 2007 to 2008. Uh, if you start to look at 2012 and 2013 levels, we're finally in the position where we could uh, start to surpass the previous highs of 2007 and 2008. Those tend to be the periods when you get the best growth in the housing market. Uh, as that employment base moves back into the size of the housing stock, and we'll talk to this a bit more later in the presentation, and you start to exceed the previous high water mark in jobs is where you start to see a little bit more um, uh, intensity of housing market demand. This looks at the construction sector only. In the last table or two, we've looked at the various sectors um, collectively. Now we're just going to look at the construction sector. Uh, you know, as all of you know in this industry, this uh, sector has quite a bit of volatility, but you can see the severity of the downdraft in the Portland area really leading the market down, if you will. 2007 to 2008 was a year where the uh, construction employment softened considerably. Then as early as 2008, we started to see quite a bit of weakness. Now think back, um, in the beginning of 2008, the national economy was still performing reasonably well. We were in the pre-financial crisis, pre Lehman Brother days, so we're already seeing a slowdown in employment here before any of the big uh, financial market earthquakes hit, if you will. Then this market, uh, the construction sector, carried much, much lower through 2009, but then started to build. So uh, by 2011, we're showing um, quite a bit of improvement carrying forward into 2012. As we mentioned, losses began early in this market uh, compared to most Western markets, but then the rebound came early. Let's look at the services sector. Quite a bit different profile in the service sector, if you notice. Uh, the, the dip, the severe downdraft, wasn't in place in the beginning of 2008 as it was in the construction sector, and it hit much later in the year. Also, the dura duration was much less. Instead of being you know, essentially three full years of negative, it's about half that period, maybe 15 to 18 months, and a full-blown recovery taking place in 2010, uh, unlike the construction sector. Let's go to trade, transportation, and utilities. Now, this is a market that's become increasingly trade-oriented. Uh, the port is very vibrant. There's a lot of uh, public efforts going into land uses, industrial parks, dredging, and different things to make the port competitive. And the entire West Coast has proved to be uh, increasingly trade-oriented, um, orienting towards trade out of the Far East and the developing economies of Southeast Asia. Now here's the government sector. Uh, you know, there's some volatility in the government sector year after year. If you think of what's taken place during the so-called Great Recession is we get a real drawdown in income tax receipts, not only, you know, on a state basis, but on a federal basis. Property tax declines uh, tend to hurt state revenues and municipal revenues, and many of those are really a lagging indicator. It takes a couple of years for real estate values to cycle their way down and move towards lower um, property tax receipts. Now many municipalities have increased property taxes along the way to offset that. Um, that almost perpetuates the cycle, but what you can see here is once the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act uh, ended, then the, local, the government sector lost a lot of support here and has been weak ever since. Um, this may be, take a couple more quarters to play out. We're going to have to keep our eye on that. Let's look at this market in terms of building permits. Now, if you know Portland area at all or have you know, followed what's taken place there, back in 1979, this area initiated um, urban growth boundaries, UGBs as they're commonly known. And this set an outer limit to incorporation for the city and really called for all development to take place within those boundaries. 
the real goal was to increase urban densities and prohibit or slow sprawl. I think the initial intent, you know, as I remember this and have studied this over the years, was to gradually allow some land to be added around the perimeter and for conversion of uses to allow a little bit more residential development. That's turned into a you know, very difficult political process to an annex along the fringes. And so at this point, almost all of the uh, development has been urban and at density. We come across a number of figures and studies that showed from 1979 to the 2000 census, the urbanization had contributed to about a 30% increase in density in Portland itself. Let's look at the total change in housing supply over this market. You can clearly see that for most of the 90s and 2000s, this area ran oh, roughly 15,000 permits per year and carried that through as high as 12,000 to 2008 before the recession and, and market financial market disruption really started to bite into uh, construction in this particular area. The last couple of years have been under 5,000 permits, very, very low. And at this point in time, housing is not coming close to keeping up with population growth. Um, now, ultimately, that supports the housing market and will, you know, support values over time. But according to our calculations, for 2011, we're drawing about one um, additional housing unit for every 7.5 new residents uh, to the MSA during the course of the year. That's really not enough to keep a, a housing stock from aging significantly where it stands. Conversion to uh, away from residential uses to commercial and other uses tends to consume some units. Not too many things burn down anymore, so that's not a problem. But in any historical areas where the housing stock is getting to be 50, 60, 70 years old, some units are nice and historical and are maintained, and others are at the end of their useful lives. So it becomes important to add housing stock just to maintain the appeal and livability of any MSA. Part of the whole job equation, of course, is incomes. Now, we look at incomes in all the markets we serve. There are some tremendous success stories on the income front, of course. And the course of the recession has created many, many winners and many, many losers. And I think it's only realistic to expect that what a recession really does is takes investment capital away from underperforming industries and channels that into new emerging industries. And that certainly happened you know, in the United States in a very profound sense. So what we've seen in this particular market is income growth has been, uh, I'd call it modest, and running about 1.43% compounded from 2003 to 2013. That's certainly not the bottom of the barrel in terms of MSA performance nationally, but it's not the top either. If you start to consider take-home pay and inflation in real everyday product, I'm not necessarily talking CPI where the government likes to include the things we all use like food and energy, but when you consider all items uh, and tax rates and this sort of thing, take-home pay has been under pressure for a couple of years here, not just in this market, but in almost all markets nationally. Here's a look at housing prices, and one of the things we've done over the years is compared the peak period to the current period and have examined where prices are in 2012, you know, noted that we're probably about 2004, 2005 era price, median price points in this area. Um, another way we like to look at this is, is take out the peak uh, years of subprime and then draw that line back through history and see how this market's performed. If you take out those you know, four, five, six years where subprime was really driving this market, you can see a uh, sustained upward trend, um, a p period of correction, certainly not as large as the uh, overheated period was, and then really a return to a long-term growth rate that comes back into sync in about 2015 and 2016. As we get a couple of years out, uh, we think demand picks up here, the economic picture steadies, and uh, we'll return to a much more uh, traditional growth rate. Those of you who've watched our many presentations and webinars in the past are familiar with our 
valuation patterns. Since we're talking about home prices, now one of the things that happens here is for years and years, um, supportable prices and actual prices were quite closely connected through the great process of loan underwriting. You had to bring a down payment, you had to check your credit score, you had to prove your income, you had to provide tax returns. And then when we got to the subprime bubble, all that went away and we lost that very important connection between what people made and you know, prices on the ground. So of course you can see prices spike tremendously here. There's really only one way for all that excess liquidity and all those large loans to affect any market and that's through greatly increased prices. And one of the things that's also happened during the whole time frame of this particular table from 1990 through the present is we've had uh, steadily lower interest rates. If you bought a home in 1980 when rates really turned around, you could have progressively or success, successively refinanced it over the years and paid lower and lower monthly payments for you know, that same home as rates came down. Now we think we're you know, in a period where this year, next year, last year, you know, it's certainly a cycle trough in interest rates and we're going to get a, a reversal of that trend what that will cause is it'll cause or it will take more income to support that same home. You can see that in the green line on this particular table right at the upper right hand side underneath the label five year forecast. When we get a reversal in rates and it takes more and more income to afford that same home in this market, that essentially puts pressure on the values. As we sit today though, that wide gap between the blue uh, forecast median home price and the supportable median home price, that's under valuation. We know what people can afford to pay for a home in this area. Uh, we know what the incomes are. We know what the interest rates are. And we know how much of their household income they'll put towards that home. And if you compare those, you see tremendous undervaluation uh, on the ground in this market and most of the markets across the country. Here's just a brief look at uh, the a pie chart for today's housing transactions, January to March 2012. And we'll talk to a couple of things here. Uh, first, new home market, builder to owner market at the bottom left, 7.5%. That is a pretty good number for this uh, day and age. Most of our Western markets have certainly not rebounded to 7.5% new home market share. Uh, this area uh, has access to uh, enough land, enough capital, and enough you know, of the business pieces to create some new homes. So 7.5 percent, you can also, we could also see that manifest in construction employment earlier in the webinar. Uh, foreclosures shown in red, that's owner back to bank or lender, 14.1 percent. Important here is that foreclosure sales, 19.2 percent, are about 5 percent higher than foreclosures. So gradually, that distressed inventory is going back out to market, back out to new ownership, and really back into the rental or occupancy pool. Uh, this market, like most, has a very efficient um, rental investor industry. We find that rental investors are a pretty savvy group by and large. They tend to know their markets, they tend to know their rental rates, they tend to know their values, and so many rental investors are are buying foreclosed homes through whatever process is legal in that municipality, quickly upgrading those and getting them back into the rental pool and really holding those units positive cash flow almost universally, uh, hoping for four or five years of appreciation and then they could sell that back into the for sale or put that unit back into the for sale market. One of the other things that happened here on the right side of the chart, the resale. That's owner to owner. That share has been increasing. That is a category that includes short sales, and we've definitely seen lenders um, use make use of more short sales to uh, control their accumulated negative assets. Quick look at supply and demand here. We talked briefly about supply earlier in terms of permits. Uh, permits tend to grow pretty slowly. Supply tends to grow pretty slowly. It's difficult to find and acquire land, develop a housing product for a given site, get that out and marketed. So those numbers don't tend to oscillate much. By comparison, the demand for housing changes quite a bit. When there's improvements in the job market, the demand can quickly outstrip the supply. 
by comparison, we get a sudden, you know, financial crisis, something with Lehman Brothers, an international financial market meltdown, and many, many jobs are lost. And suddenly, as you can see here in 2009 and 2010, the supply of housing, the housing stock that's built and on the ground is really too large for the employment base at that point in time. Now that really continues through 2012, 2013. By the end of 2013, we're really sort of back to equilibrium. Improvements in economy, in the economy, more people being employed, uh, increase that demand, and those two lines gradually come back into equilibrium, and we have a much more balanced housing market in this area. Now here's our look at market expectations. Now we've covered employment, taking a look at prices, taking a look at permits. Uh, we think the employment picture is much better here than it is in many Western markets. You know, if you're on the ground here and you're looking for a job, it might not seem that way, but numerically and statistically, this area recovered uh, much more strongly in 2010 than most Western markets and had a good year in 2011. Growth is somewhat slower in 2012, but we're building on a good base. The UGB, the urban growth boundaries we've talked about a little earlier, favor attached housing. Um, but we've seen, you know, a fair amount of demand for detached homes leak out to other markets, move out to other areas. Uh, there's some other factors that are going to tie into that that we'll talk about here in just a second. One of the things we continue to hear from people on the ground is that the resale inventory has drawn down tremendously. This is a phenomenon that seems like it's occurring in more and more markets across the country. We haven't seen price improvements in a lot of these markets with low inventory, but you know, once the inventory gets low enough, the only way more homes get listed and more supply becomes available is for uh, prices to go up a little bit. Now, banks might have some inventory that they can put out that seems to be taking some time. We're expecting some more units out of many banks, but a lot of that, um, nationally we know the banks are carrying a lot of units, but on a local basis it, it tends to vary quite a bit. Lender performance in terms of asset management has tended to vary quite a bit, so we have markets where the lenders are doing quite well and they actually have houses going back to the market in a reasonable and orderly process, and we see some other places where that's certainly not the case. So we'll have to watch that, but uh, as we mentioned, the resale inventory is quite low here. That leads to a situation where you know we hear of multiple offers for attractive resales. People are writing sweetheart notes and love letters to sellers, telling them how they love their house, this sort of thing. Uh, that really puts a lot of pressure on resale agents. You know, they have to have a good offer. They put pressure on buyers to make a good offer. They want to present that immediately you know, inspection contingencies and that sort of thing, unfortunately, fall by the wayside. But competition is definitely heating up in the resale market. As I mentioned, lenders appear to be holding more distress units than, than are typical. You know, we had moratoriums, we had slowdowns, we had robo-signings in the national settlement with the big banks, that sort of thing. There's bound to be a lag after that, but we think uh, lenders holding some of these units um, having passed the most recent stress test, probably have a little bit greater appetite to start freeing themselves of some of their REO homes. Now this is an area not really associated usually with a lot of mature market owners, but this area does have a fairly large mature market cohort. Um, most of the Truly mature uh, homeowners are immobile, don't like to move, won't want to list their homes. So that puts a little bit of uh, some of the housing stock in the hands of people who won't sell for any price. Um, they've endured the last drawdown. Most of them don't have loans. Most of them have been free and clear for years. They want to stay. So that you know takes that certain uh, percentage of homes out of the stock and really requires much greater velocity out of the rest of the market to meet resale demand. So, as I mentioned, unexpectedly uh, large mature market in this area. We saw construction employment and new home market share uh, definitely are suggesting recovery and a return towards more normalized market conditions. We realize this varies market to market. There are high demand markets that have been showing improvement for you know, 12 or 15 months now, and some of the um, 
less appealing, less desirable markets with less demand are really taking their time. Uh, buyers have really thrown the cards up in the air, if you will, and have sorted them through and gone back to preferred neighborhoods, back to high demand areas. You know, people tended to buy weak uh, locations and weak product when the market was hot, but now that the market has had, you know, four or five years to really sort its out, sort itself out, the high demand locations are in much stronger demand. Uh, rental rates uh, continue to show quite a spread here to home ownership uh, costs. So we think um, uh, people are going to want to continue to rent here. A lot of the rental stock, I shouldn't say a lot, but there are you know, quite a few uh, very modern, you know, high-rise, high-end structure rental programs and communities in this area. Those lead to high rental costs. There are, this area, Portland, has gained a certain um, uh, demand from people moving in around the country. It's got a certain grunge, cool sort of element that's drawn a lot of people that tend to be renters. Um, but the demographics and the good economics uh, and the good job growth in this area will gradually reorient people back towards for sale product. People will prefer to own when they have the financial means and they believe that the financial conditions are suitable. As you know, we produce a weekly webinar um, here at Real Estate Economics. We may be going to a summer schedule here soon, uh, but we'll keep it posted on our website, www.realestateeconomics.com. You can see the upcoming areas we're going to cover and a variety of our products listed here. I'm John Molvo. Uh, here's my contact information. If you have any questions or comments about today's presentation, you want to ask a question about your market area, find out about any of our programs, our products, our business tools, our consulting services, uh, please call me. We're always interested in talking to people in the market and seeing what their opinions are. Thank you for joining us. Have a nice day.